Okay, thank you. What's going on, people? Let's do a little live stream. What do you say? A little live stream. We're going to cover three topics today. We've got Pittsburgh police. Yeah, they're like, yeah, they don't have enough cops. So, uh, you know what? We're just not going to answer any calls. We're going to send them on to a voicemail system. <laughs> They've got a special name for it, but they're, they're calling it something else. An enhanced voice recording data machine. I don't know. What. Seattle Police Department is still wildly struggling. These are, all, these are both defund the police topics. Years later, here we are. We're still talking about, oh, well, if we could just get some more cops in here. That's not really happening. And then our third topic today is, here's why New York City migrants aren't accepting free plane bu or bus tickets out of town. They're being handed free plane tickets. Hey, you could go to Denver. Uh, probably not Denver right now just because it's so snowy there, right? All my Denver peeps out there, I hope you guys stay safe. I was reading uh, City of Denver is telling... Um, City of Denver is telling the illegals, all right, so you guys need to either take shelter, even though we've kicked you out of shelter, or you need to go to another city because we got a big snowstorm coming in. Most of these people have probably never seen snow, right? I mean, I don't know. How much snow do you have? And maybe that's a totally, you know, useless statement. But um, Denver snowstorm, that's something to be contended with. And this one I understand is... Uh, <laughs> getting some snow let's uh let's do our intro here and we'll get going but i hope the rest of you guys are out there staying safe staying warm weather here in, in seattle we're gonna hit we're gonna hit 70 degrees on sunday that is barn burner weather you can see i've got my uh, short sleeve shirt on because it's sunny out right now and if it's sunny um it, i think it was 37 on my way into work this morning but um you know some sunny cold We'll take whatever we can get here in Seattle. Let's get this intro going, and uh, we'll get on the road here. Thanks, you guys, for being here. See a lot of regulars there. Get myself together here. Okay, and we are all systems go, it appears. We'll do this, we'll do a little bit more of a formal look. Big open collar, can't have that. We've got standards here, got things going on. All right, Tristan, here we go. Pittsburgh police say they will no longer respond to calls that are not in progress emergencies. This is amid a staffing shortage. This is fallout continuing from the defund the police debacle from the summer of love. Let's get into it. Let's go to Pittsburgh. Let's see what's going on. Here we go. You know what this means? Assume the position of watching a video. Watch a little video. Okay. Got to take that off. Don't mind me as I'm setting up your video. And then we've got to go that one. Look at that. Got it first try. Rick, what was the big takeaway today? Yeah, Susan, residents of the city will see a major change in the way police respond. They will no longer respond to calls that aren't considered in progress emergency. That means calls like criminal mischief, theft, harassment, and most burglary alarms will all be handled by an enhanced telephone reporting unit. That means residents. Okay, that's the only time I'm going to stop this. An enhanced telephone reporting unit. An answering machine. Your call is going to go to an answering machine. If you're in Pittsburgh and you're like, uh, is this 911? Uh, please leave a message. We're not here. We'll catch up with you in a week from Sunday. How excited would you be to hear that? You're hard-earned taxpayers' dollars. Somebody's breaking into your place. Uh, I guess it's a burglary in pro. This is nuts. This is nuts. But, you know, I mean, it's not shocking, right? You only have so many cops. What are you going to do? 
Police will file a police report over the phone. Officers will not respond unless it's an emergency. Also, between the hours of 3 a.m. and 7 a.m., there will be no officers at any of the six stations throughout the city. Call boxes that link directly to 911 have been installed for people to use in case of an emergency. And during the overnight shift, there will be as few as 20 officers to cover the entire city. The chief said today the data supports that. Yes, it's enough to cover the entire city in, in those hours when we have 8% of the time people are calling. I'm confident in the decisions that we make that it impacts this bureau and the city in a much better way than we have in the past. Now, the chief also acknowledging today that some of these changes are due to staffing shortages. He's down to 740 officers, well below the 850 they would like to have. Now, coming up new at 5, residents, city council, and the police union all weighing in on these big changes that begin Monday. Live in the studio, Rick Earl, Channel 11 News. So this is this is not this is not just this is not just Pittsburgh. This is th these are police departments all across the United States. They just they're not recruiting enough people. Been raiding about Seattle, kids Seattle, and we're going to talk about it in probably half an hour here or so. Um, there's just not enough people with interest, and you know, shockingly, <laughs> it is not surprising that people don't want to be a cop. You want to be a cop in Pittsburgh? You want to be a cop in Seattle? No, I don't think you do. I don't think you do. The um, the, the pay in Seattle is way below what other nearby, we're going to get into that. But what the police chief is basically working on, what the police chief is talking about is personnel management. He's got XYZ for a budget. He's only got this many cops that have that are that are on board that are able to go out and serve the public so you've got this much coverage and you've got this much bandwidth that you have to cover all right so the majority of our calls are coming in from here to here those late late night or early morning depend on what time you get up that time period yeah you're going to get that enhanced telephone recording process instead it's just <laughs> it's not shocking this is the culmination of that geniusness that was defund the police. Now, I did some research on Pittsburgh, and Pittsburgh does have Democrat, Democrat-leaning city council. Let's put, let's put it that way. It doesn't look like they, and correct me if I'm wrong, it doesn't look like they actually defunded their police, um, but you've definitely got an anti-police sentiment, as you do in most big cities. Ah, we hate the cops, except for when you need them, and except for when those, you know, criminal statistics just shoot through the roof and ah, we got to get some more cops up in here. Let's get some more cops. Let's read this story. Pittsburgh police announced this week that they will no longer respond to calls that are not in progress emergency. I mean, that part right there is just like, okay, so what, 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 what are you responding to? How about the no cops at the police department, the in individual call, the, the uh, precincts, I think it was, Pittsburgh of, uh, Bureau of Police have made major changes to its operation as it battles staffing shortage, including no longer responding to what we already talked about. Police Chief Larry Skiroto announced in February that during the early morning hours, oh, that's this sounds hopeful, doesn't it? Early morning hours, okay. What is most of the stuff going on? Early morning hours, there will be fewer officers on staff and lower priority calls will get sent to a telephone reporting unit rather than a person. Then you can save on 911 call operators, too. I mean, who doesn't want that? I mean, we're just saving money left and right. Except you're making the city basically less safe. Yeah, your call is going to go right through to an answering machine. Is somebody is somebody returning those phone calls? Is somebody answering the phone? Is, is there, hello, is there anybody out there? The chief said that the changes need to be made so that his 740 officers can more efficiently serve the community. He's got XYZ bandwidth. He's got to do something. All right, that's what we're going to do. Not saying it's good. I'm not saying it's bad, but he's doing something. My thought is, is well, this should work out fine, right? I mean, I'm not personally living in Pittsburgh. So well, my Pittsburgh people, I mean, this should make you concerned. Like, where is our tax dollar actually going to these enhanced recording? <laughs> 
to the recorder. It's going to the recorder, right? Remember when you used to run home and, ah, did anybody call? No, there's no, there's no blinking light on my machine. Remember you were, you were so tied to that damn machine. Like, oh, who's going to call me? One of my tasks in, um, in the appraisal office, Reynolds and Klein, back when, when I didn't own it, was to, um, if I got there early, was to review the messages and see who called, see what happened, because we didn't have cell phones, right? No cell phones. So now you've got an enhanced telephone reporting unit. According to WPXI, calls for theft, harassment, criminal mischief, and burglary alarms will all be handled by the telephone reporting unit. Or not, because it doesn't do anything. It's just a recorder, right? It's just a recorder, all right? So who is going to handle them? And then by the time somebody does review them, what are they going to do? What are you going to do? Hey, we got some criminal mischief going on here that happened eight hours ago. Yeah, those guys are, those guys are, it's 11 a.m. and those guys are in, in bed. I mean, they're, they're going to be sleeping until 2.30 in the afternoon. Uh, we're not going to be able to catch them. We get burglary alarms. Oh, it's, that's handy. You get a really nice security system. Okay, yeah. Got this great security system. And I'm pitching you a house now. We got this great security system. You know, it's got sensors on all the doors. It's got sensors on the garage door. It's got sensors 10 ways from Tuesday out on the patio, around the hot tub. I mean, the walkway up to the front, front door. Um, but the, the, the little problem there is that, yeah, cops won't come. Oh, okay. All right. I feel better already. Yeah. When there is an event that is not in progress, we're going to take an en route, a reroute that, that call to our telephone reporting unit. Uh, okay. Uh, who determines? I mean, how, how do we figure out? Uh, I got somebody coming at me right now. Does the answering machine take that? I mean, he said the early morning hours is when there are the lowest amount of calls, and from 3 a.m. to 7 a.m., police stations will not have an officer at the desk. This just sounds like a recipe for disaster. This sounds horrible, but I get it. You've got to make a budget work, and you've only got so many cops. Now, the curious thing, which we'll get into in a little bit, is how many police officers they have. They have damn near as many as Seattle does, and Seattle is 775,000 people in incorporated in, in city limits. Pittsburgh is 300-something thousand. So any which way you look at it, yeah, nobody's going to come to your house. There's going to be no police service for these amount of calls that we used to have. Sure, it should work out fine. It'll work out. It'll, it'll be good. Those criminals, they are, they're just going to back off and go, you know what? We need to make things a little bit more even, Stephen, here. So, therefore, we're not going to um, – criminal activity between 3 and 7 a.m., no can do. Got to cut those numbers down. So, <laughs> so, he said the early morning hours when the lowest amount of calls. Data shows from between 3 a.m. to 7 a.m. that we had 8% of our call volume we had 33% of our personnel working during those periods of time. So he's trying to match up what you've got going on here, you know, when you need the help and when you don't. Burglar alarms will require a second confirmation before an officer responds because Skiroto said that in a year of 9,500 burglary calls, the majority of them were false alarms. Oh, that's frustrating. But it cost the department 4,000 personnel hours. That part to me made sense. I mean, but if 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 you're on the end of having a burglar come into your home, you might feel differently. I'm just saying. You might just, you might be in the camp of, I just want a cop to come no matter what. That's probably where I'd be, right? Send a cop. Don't care. Send a cop. It's not whether we won't respond to alarms. It's that we're going to require there to be a second verification, a second verification, uh, authentication factor such as it's not just the front door. There's interior motion, there's video, there's audio, there's glass brick. I don't know. If your house is getting broken into, can you confirm that you're being broken into? Yeah, right? Other schedule changes include officers switching to 10-hour shifts for four. So they're going to do four tents, four 10-hour shifts for four days a week and one-hour breaks to focus on their mental health. You might scoff at that. You might laugh at that. I don't get a mental health. What the cops deal with is just horrific. You wouldn't want to deal with the amount of just insanity that they, these people. I read a lot of you know crime stories and just the ridiculousness and the beatdown that the cops take. 
I mean, it's just, I did a story not long ago that most of you didn't tune into. <laughs> Diehards probably did. But it was a Bellevue police officer who fell off. You know, his motorcycle basically ejected him while he was covering Kamala Harris, vice president detail in Seattle. And he fell like 50 feet down onto Interstate 5 and he got really messed up. Then the city of Bellevue wasn't going to, after six months, wasn't going to basically continue his health care insurance, even though the guy is basically in a wheelchair and unable to walk, and barely able to do uh, physical therapy, and he couldn't work. So there is that whole story. But the, the bottom line from that is I think the Bellevue, Bellevue's going to work that guy out. They're going to figure something out, get him kind of going again. But, you know, the one hour of mental health break a day, the, the, the ridiculousness that we have in society now, think of all just the insanity of all the people on drugs and the people that used to be in mental institutions. Cops deal with that now. That's, cops are on the front line of that. So at the same time, we did all this defund the police. This is the greatest thing ever. Let's just crap on policing as a profession in general. I'm sure this will work out great. Let's divert all those funds into community social worker systems and whatnot. And I'm not saying you shouldn't divert money, you shouldn't place money into community systems that help, you know, foster good things, but you shouldn't be taking it away from police protection. And in so many communities, you just, the police department does not have the ability to recruit and successfully recruit. And by that, I mean, bring in enough people to offset the number of officers that are retiring or just flat out quitting and saying, no more, we're not doing this. This is a terrible profession. I'm out of here. Let some other young person take over my spot because I don't want to do this anymore. This is not worth it. The pay isn't worth it. And, you know, I've got that broken shoulder and I've got that left leg that doesn't work all that great anymore. You know, all kinds of injuries and dings that you take, but particularly policing, like the guy in the motorcycle, right? It's not um, Tristan Cut. And let's go with, let me get a drink of water here. There we go, Tristan. So other schedule changes include officers switching to 10-hour shifts. Okay, we talked about that. And we got the one-hour mental um, mental health. What I was also going to say in the mental health for cops is that um, you've been working, a lot of these police departments, they have been working around the clock. And the only way that a lot of these police departments are able to make things go is to have officers do overtime. You can only press, I don't care what profession it is, you can only press people for so long. We used to find that out in the appraisal industry when we'd go through a refinance boom, meaning when rates would drop, you know, half a point, point, uh, whatever it was. Um, we went through, you know, some periods in the late 80s where rates would just, they were making these huge drops. So we'd have all these orders come in and we, we you know, you got to get them done. So there's only so many appraisers and you can't hire anybody when you're in the midst of one of those refinance boom runs. It just doesn't happen. Everybody's already busy. Nobody has time to train anybody. You're out there doing the appraisals, coming back, writing them up, sending them out. Just boom, boom, boom. But you can only have people work seven days a week for so long. You can only have people do overtime for so long. And things start to go a little wonky mentally, right? I know there's a lot of other professions that are in the same boat. You've got um, nurses, good example. You know, you've got all of these professions, but there's just not enough people to go around. And... You know, you can only squeeze, you can't get blood from a turnip. Well, you can only squeeze the turnip for so long. And after a while, yeah, there's no more there either, right? So Bob Schwartzwelder, he's the president of the union that represents Pittsburgh police, told the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette that due to the cutbacks, there are only 14 or 15 police officers on duty now between 3 a.m. and 7 a.m. 14 or 15. So if you have one incident, one major incident, boom. Th those cops, they're, they're all done. There's no other police to cover the whatever else you've got going on. Sorry you're getting robbed. Sorry you, you know, had a terrible car crash. I mean, it, it's not viable. It's not viable long-term, right? I think the strategy at this point is a hope and a prayer that they can base everyone on data. It may pan out to be correct. It may be disastrous. This is this is what the president of the police union in Pittsburgh is saying. It may be disastrous. 
you, you've only got so many personnel. So you can't make up cops. You can't just, you know, you can't send a social worker out there. So what do you do? All right. Take the time period where you've got the fewest calls and you make a judgment call and you go with it. Might be horrific. We don't know. We'll find out. District Attorney Steve Zapala told WTAE that he was critical of the changes and they didn't make sense to him. <laughs> okay. All right. And you are not a police officer, but I understand the sentiment. It doesn't make a lot of sense. Is there any other large city in the country that there's a part time police department? I mean, does that make any sense to any of you guys? It doesn't to me, Zapala said. Oh, it doesn't to me either. But what's the alternative? What are you going to do? You still got the criminal activity going on. You just, you don't have the supply of cops. You've got demand. Demand out there. Bad guys are still out there doing their thing. So what do you want to do? Which option do you want to take? You don't have any. All right. I guess, uh, I guess we'll, we'll go part-time during the wee hours of the morning. I don't understand what he's doing. I have to sit down with the chief about that. And, to some of the things in the policing areas. I don't get it. Well, okay. Um, yeah, th there isn't much to get there. You got to make a call somewhere. Maybe he's making the wrong call. We don't know. We don't have, have the data to look back. But any which way, I guess, would be my assessment of this. Any which way, it's not going to be a good call. It's not going to be an easy call. It's going to be a terrible call. And the citizens of Pittsburgh are going to suffer. Just like the citizens in Seattle. Hey, don't bother calling the cops because it may take them a long time to get here. You know, you've, you've got that sentiment. If there's enough issues going on in Seattle, cops do their best to get out there. But there's just not enough of them. And Pittsburgh has almost as many as Seattle. And Seattle's a way, way bigger city. Pittsburgh Mayor Ed Ganey supported Scarotti's decision to make cutbacks on staffing. I'm sure they had a little talk beforehand, don't you think? The chief has made clear that there was a cutback, but there was going to be patrolmen there and there would be patrol people ready to go. So again, that's why I'm saying you always have to talk to the person that's implementing the new rules. That's the chief uh, or the public safety director, Ganey said. What, what do you do? What do you do? You don't have enough cops. You've still got, you know, the, the city didn't go away, did it? The city didn't go away. Where did it go? Nowhere. It's still there. Still got the same amount of criminal activity. That's where these whole the, these folks that just went down this defund the police were just so mentally incompetent. That's the only way, the only word you can put to it. And in that the next uh, story I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about. We're going to watch a video from September of 2020, and you can just see the insanity of the people that were pushing the defund the police. I'm holding my baby. This is one segment I just walked in looked at, I'm holding my baby and I want, I want the Amer American public to know her with some, some damn story, that I'm on the right side of history. And she's one of the council members in Seattle that voted to defund the police. Yeah, no, you're not. You put your own videotape on the wrong end of the decision. We've proven that. Remember how, um, if you said anything about, you know, negatively defunding the police, if you were critical of, defend, of defunding the police, that you were, you were basically, oh, no, 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 we're supporting that right now. We're, we're on board with that. And then you know, shortly after that, it was in 2021, early 2021, it, it started to come back around. It, it was early. Maybe it was June of 2021. But I remember doing stories thinking, boy, that didn't take long. We figured this one out. But by then, the damage has already been done. So many police departments had already been defunded. And yet you've still got this fallout and the fallout is happening, you know, three, four years later, right? It's literally years later because nobody wants to be a cop. The overall sentiment hasn't changed. Don't like the police. They're terrible human beings. They murder everybody, murder everybody in the BIPOC community. When in reality, that's just not what's going on. But this whole mental position of cops are bad. Now, well, here's what happens when entire communities and Councils, uh, city councils go down that road. People aren't dumb. They realize, oh, this is not a profession that I really need to get into. This is not something that, you know, I need to be involved in. And so on greater scale throughout the United States, there are some police forces that are doing okay. And there's many, many like Pittsburgh that are suffering greatly. 
and they're having to make decisions, hard decisions, because you've only got so much bandwidth and you're not able to recruit right now to backfill the number of cops. What did Pittsburgh say they wanted? Like 850 and they've got 700 something? That's not crazy bad. Seattle's lost six, 700 police officers since 2020. Yeah, that's a lot. And, and hasn't, we're, we're, we're continuously on an either a break even or we're still losing cops. We're on a negative. Just haven't been able to get that traction. And I think so much of it has to do with that whole defund the police sentiment and, um, and how much police have been crippled at, at being able to do their job. They've just been hamstrung. Just, uh, you can't do that, can't do that, can't do that. And then we wonder why the criminals run free when knowing full well, well, if I commit this crime, uh, this is going to go to a voice recorder vo box machine. It's going to go to a, <laughs> it's going to go to somebody's, you know, answering service. So why wouldn't I commit this crime? There's no real reason. And knowing full well, after somebody does review that call, you know, it's already happened. You don't have the police officers to follow up. So what's going to happen? Criminals know there's opportunity. So Pittsburgh, we'll be keeping an eye on, on that situation and we'll just have to see kind of where it goes. But yeah, not good. Not, not the right direction you want to be heading. But it is what it is, right? It is what it is. All right, I'm going to wrap up this one. Thank you so much for being here. I will keep um, reporting on Pittsburgh. We don't take a look at Pittsburgh very often because most of the time they've, I don't know, they've just got their own thing going on and don't have huge stories. But this is one that I thought needed to be called out because. Um, yeah, I don't think that's going to work out all that well. It's already not working all that well. Thanks again for being here. I'll catch up with you in the next segment. Bye for now. All right, I'm going to tee up my next segment here. Let's see what you guys are talking about. Interesting comment on uh, somebody who's in Pittsburgh. It's mostly kids that commit the crimes. We don't have juvenile detention centers here, so kids don't get charged. So what's the point in arresting them? I think we've got a similar deal here going on in Seattle, uh, one of our cities here. No, they were gonna, they're going to disband the juvenile detention facilities and um, put them in some kind of camp. It, it made no sense at all. Yeah, the juveniles. Yeah, we got a lot of kids doing crime here, too. I mean, it's just happening. Kids know if they're under 18, you know, they're basically going to have all pass. And the gangs that they're running around with, they know also that's what's going to happen, right? All right, let's get this one going. Kristen, here we go. The fallout from defund the police continues, continues to decimate Seattle police numbers. Not able to recruit enough, not able to retain enough. Numbers are personally alarming, says the Seattle police chief, as he presents ideas as officers' numbers sink. Ugh, not going well here in Seattle. Who would have thought? Who would have thought aftermath of that defund the police thing would still be impacting us in 2024? A lot of us did. and We made that known, right? Let's get into it. Here we go. Here we go. Watch a little video. This is a video from September of 2020. This was, remember the Summer of Love was basically May through early July. Early July is when CHOP got shut down. That's when I kind of refer to it. Ah, it's Summer of Love for about a couple of weeks. Two black kids get murdered. This was September. This was shortly thereafter. August, everybody's, ah, defund the police, greatest thing ever. Never mind those two black kids that got murdered in the police no-go zone. Don't worry about that. This is going to be the greatest thing ever. Defund the police. Here's a video that covered it at that time. 
not the 50 percent cut that demonstrators have been demanding it. all summer long. Yeah, but again. to Here be clear, this is not the 50 percent cut that demonstrators have been demanding all summer long. But also, this is not the compromise plan B that we told you about on Monday that the mayor had agreed to. But for those who do want to see the police defunded, they say this is a step in the right direction. But some in Seattle's business community say this is just another setback to add to the list of 2020. It has been a hell of a summer and it has been a hell of a 400 years for the black and brown and indigenous communities. Raining. They deserved better. Terrible. After listening to 90 minutes of public comment overwhelmingly in favor of overruling the mayor's veto of cuts to SBD's budget, that's exactly what the city council did. The mayor's veto is overridden. In three votes, the council overruled the mayor's August veto, meaning bills to reinvest those funds into the community will pass. This came as a surprise as just yesterday, Council President Lorena Gonzalez laid out a possible plan B that would only cut a million dollars from SPD's budget this year, as well as some other changes. The mayor agreed to that. Nine in favor, none opposed. Now, SPD is faced with a $3 million reduction, the loss of 100 jobs, and cuts to programs like the navigational team. I want to be able to tell my daughter, who I'm currently holding in my arms, that I did the right thing and that I voted on the right side of history. In a statement, King County Equity Now and Decriminalize Seattle, two groups at the forefront of Seattle's racial justice movement, said although the cut is only about 1% of SPD's budget, this is an encouraging step, saying, quote, today we celebrate the work that we've all put in to make this opportunity a reality. The majority of the few public comments, though, asking the council to sustain the vetoes, were from Seattle's business community. Well, we're absolutely oh. concerned about how this is going to affect Seattle. Laura Radford from the West Seattle Junction Association says between COVID-19 and a rise in security concerns, taking away resources is only going to kick small businesses while they're already down. You know, small businesses, they create the fabric of our neighborhoods and we need them to come back stronger than ever. And with the vote today, we're not sure if that's gonna be able to happen. A few hours after that vote, the mayor's office did release a three paragraph response. So the mayor said in part, the mayor thought they had built that consensus on many issues in the compromise legislation introduced yesterday, Monday, while council members have publicly stated they wanted to work with Mayor Durkin to address issues in the 2020 budget. They chose a different path. As far as that $3 million figure that will be taken out of SPD's budget for the remainder of the year, uh, we do not have a set plan on how exactly that will be reinvested into the community. Yeah. And it doesn't matter now because it just, it didn't go well. It, this whole thing didn't go well. And everybody knows, it. everybody knows that was a terrible idea. Just ah, defund the police, greatest concept ever. Mm, no. No, it wasn't, folks. That was just, that was just knuckleheadedness right there, right? Shenanigans, I say. All right, let's get into this article. Seattle uh, City Council members were briefed on the Seattle Police Department's recruitment project on Tuesday. <laughs> and they were not pleased. It's like, all right, so what are you really doing here? Because we don't have enough cops up in here. What are you really doing here? Well, here's my 14-point PDF document on my PowerPoint presentation. Some council members criticized the department for losing more officers than were hired in recent years. That has been the ongoing trend. That has been why you've got, you know, numbers of criminal activity rising in areas. And then people saying, no, no, they're, they're actually dropping, Sean. It's because nobody's reporting them anymore. Council member Rob Saka, District 1, said it was unsettling to see the low staffing numbers. Everybody keeps saying that in all of these cities across the United States. We have concern. It's unsettling. This is unsustainable. Kind of sounds like the mayors of the Democrat-run sanctuary cities, right? This is unsettling. Uh, it's not sustainable. I am personally alarmed and dismayed to see that, he said. Seattle Police Department Chief Adrian Diaz reported Tuesday on his project presentation that staffing levels are at their lowest with over 700 officers departing his department since 2019, you know, if you had a police department like, um, uh, yeah, here it is, New York City, 36,000 officers and you lose 700, okay, all right, 
But when you've only, when you only got, you know, thousand, you know, 1,400, I think it was when, when they began, something like that, 1,500 in a big city like Seattle and, and you lose them. Ugh. Yeah, it's the lowest levels since the 1990s and the population has increased significantly. In comparison, the population of Seattle is 733,000 according to the United States uh, Census Bureau. That means there is one law enforcement officer for every 804 people who reside in the city of Seattle. That number is closer to 236. So New York City has 36,000 in a city of 8.5 million. So New York City per person has literally three times as many cops because they have prioritized policing. They know they need the cops. They learned from that whole Rudy Giuliani thing, right? Just, okay, all right. Even though some of the... Uh, some of the migrant crime stories coming out right now. I know you guys are sending those to me left and right. And you know what? Individual stories, those I, I try and work those in, but I oftentimes don't report on those because it's like, all right, somebody got assaulted. Eh, that's terrible. But what's the real story? So I'm always working on, all right, what's the greater picture here? And the greater picture in today, and this, this topic right here is the impact of defund the police is still wildly significant. But on top of that, it's the overall attitude towards policing in these big blue Democrat run cities, right? It's that attitude. Oh, we don't really like cops. Yeah, we don't, we're not, we're not really down with the police. Well, and it shows and nobody wants to be a cop in your community. So good luck with that. Enjoy, have fun. Diaz, Diaz, the police, Seattle police chief, he told the council Tuesday that num that pay is the number one factor for incoming officers and that 14 other local cities pay more. So let's take a look at that real quick. Let's just see what does that mean? So you've got, you've got the big mothership, Seattle, and then you've got this little fine graph here from his report. All the way down at 15, you've got Seattle, and they're paying 83 grand. Seattle's got a $30,000 bonus for police officers for uh, a lateral, meaning somebody that's already a cop, they're ready to go up and running 30 K. And then you've got 7,500 for a new hire. But the bottom line is those are one-time payments. And if you're only making 83, why not apply with Redmond where Microsoft is? I'm literally a couple of miles from Redmond's um, uh, one Microsoft way in, in Microsoft headquarters. You're 101,000 there. Kent, which is a city just to the south of here, is at 96. Bellevue, my hometown here and where I'm recording from, 95,000. Everett, 94. And it goes on down. So Seattle probably has the most criminal activity, and yet it pays not top five, not top 10, barely in the top 20. So it's not shocking that Seattle has a recruiting police problem. So George Floyd's death at the hands of officers from the Minneapolis Police Department. Well, was it really at the hands? I know there were hands physically there from police officers, but if you watch that whole documentary that came out recently, you're like, hmm, I've watched it a couple of times. I mean, that really made me think, boy, there's some shenanigans going on there. You, you've got some tomfoolery in there, the way that case was handled. And um, at the hands of officers from Minneapolis Police Department in May 2020, sparked conversations about police brutality and racism. I think that was just a wildly opportunistic time period. And the far left, the extreme left, they just went ham. And they did a really great job at doing that. They're, they're really good at that. They're really good at that. You're there to protect and serve the communities that you live in. And if you see something wrong, like racial injustice, you need to have the courage to say something, said former Washington police officer Craig Dockstatter in an interview with Cairo News Radio in 2020. You know, everything since 2020 has been upside down and backwards. We've kind of tried to get back to the way things were, but I, I don't think that's, that's, that's not going to happen in the short term. And it's so many of these communities where you did defund the police and you've got a significant number of residents that are saying, still defund the police. When I drive around Seattle, you will still see 
Black Lives Matter and defund the police in people's homes. And you're like, okay, yeah, you didn't see how that all worked out. You didn't see the train wreck that came from all of that. All right, okay. So now you're, you know, you are blessed with fewer cops protecting your community and keeping your community safe. One of the things I was going to say is that we are continually having businesses shut down here in Seattle, continually having businesses shut down. And right now, one of the hotbeds of activity is the Aurora Avenue North, Highway 99. It is just loaded with prostitutes. It is loaded with human trafficking. I mean, they are literally walking around all kinds of weather, day and night, in less than negligee. Let's just say that. Less than negligee. Small stuff, right? Not the, not the, I'm going to wear my pajamas to bed kind of stuff. They're just literally out there showing all of their wares. And this is ongoing and businesses are struggling. Businesses are shutting down. And the police department, they've, they've kind of got this area where it's just been given a hall pass. There's not enough cops. They're off, you know, working on real cases. And, but the, the amount of human trafficking going on in that part of Seattle is, is mind-blowing. And it's a major arterial to the north of Seattle that you go through. You just drive up there any any point in time. And because Seattle is a city that has decided, yeah, def defunding our police is the greatest concept, and then also not arresting prostitutes, however you want to call them, I don't know what the particular term is today, um, <laughs> Wish we had a term like newcomers that we could place on them, but um, sex opportunists, I butchered that last word, but I don't know, right? Because we don't have a law in the books that allows the police to arrest them while they are out parading their wares. And I mean, they are parading all of them. It's just this free for all. You've got an open system where pimps are out there and the, the girls are out there and it's just this craziness but businesses are shutting down left and right because that's not exactly hey come to my business where are you located ah uh, 105th in aurora Oof, yeah no thanks i uh, appreciate you taking my call click you know because who wants to deal with that kind of stuff seattle police department is unleashing flashbangs mace tear gas they're running into protesters with their bikes they have very large sticks We're, they're wearing riot gear so the only option is to begin to fund and demilitarize. De de We're calling for a 50% defund of the Seattle Police Department, and we demand that those dollars be invested in community-based alternatives to incarceration, community-based alternatives for public safety. And this was said by community organizer, attorney, and former Seattle mayoral candidate, Nikita Oliver. Good Lord. Thanks. Thank so thankful she did not win. That would have been, that would have been just, that would have been like Hades going on right now. Have you watched, uh, followed up on any of the, um, the, the, the gang leader named Barbecue? Yeah, Barbecue. Got a little, just a scooch of cannibalism going on in Haiti. They're not, they're not eating them because they're hungry. They're eating them just to, you know, prove a point. Hey, I'm hardcore. Gonna eat this dude's hand. That kind of thing, right? And a lot of folks are saying, oh, they're not really cannibals. When you eat other human beings flesh, you are a cannibal. I don't care. You chew it up. Ugh, it's just gross, right? Just so gross. That whole Haiti thing. That's not going to go well. I know Ron DeSantis down in uh, Florida, he's, um, he's mobilizing the troops because they're expecting a big uh, litany of people to come out of Haiti. And I don't blame them. You've got some real instability there. In 2020, Cairo News Radio also talked to the director of the Soto Business Improvement Area, Aaron Goodman about the city proposals, uh, city council's proposal to ax 50% of the Seattle Police Department's budget. In the end, in the end, they whacked about 17%. So we're not talking huge numbers, but it's more the impact it had on the psyche of people who might have wanted to become cops at that point in time. All you had to watch was like one segment of the evening news here in Seattle, and you would have seen you know, just defund the police. We hate the cops. Cops are terrible. Get rid of all the cops. Bring in the social workers. You know, all of this just absolute ridiculousness. You know, shenanigans for days during that summer of love, right? 
you're probably familiar. We worked last year bringing attention to the prolific offender situation in Seattle. And I would say that Soto businesses are very supportive of the police department and they feel they're very responded to. You got to have a police force that's able to go out and protect their folks and specifically in the business community. But there are so many break ins happening because we don't have bandwidth of enough cops. So that's kind of that, that's what's driving a lot of this. But this is the overall this is what happens in a blue liberal run Democrat city. This is what happens. And um, people want to justify it by saying, yeah, but there's there's always a lot of crime. Big cities have big crime. Well, there's similar sized cities that didn't defund their police that have been able to recruit and hold their police officers because they respect their police officers. Typically, those are not states or cities located on the West Coast. Don't have a lot of that. You got some here in eastern Washington, you've got some communities that would fall under that, but they're so far away from Seattle. Same thing in Oregon. You've got eastern Oregon, you've got communities in eastern Oregon where they are so far away from the shenanigans of the big city that they just, they do not fall, you know, within the impact and the negative impact, I would say. So, however, there are other elements within the entire criminal justice system that are also not functioning. That would mean that someone might be arrested on their property and then taken back, might be back the very next day. We see that time and time and time again. Just, oh, here's a good example of that. <laughs> Yesterday, was it the day before? I think it was Tuesday. On Tuesday, I had a text. Yeah, it was Tuesday. I had a text from Andrea Suarez of We Heart Seattle. Gal goes out and she and her crew and her um, company, they go out and they do outreach to the homeless encampments. So she texted me and she said, Steve Irwin's back. And that's the, um, that's the excavator man, the mining man in the Seattle park. Did a little bit of logging, a little bit of mining, a little bit of excavating. I mean, he is literally a Renaissance man, but he was arrested. His entire, you know, cabin made out of logs that he had, <laughs> he had logged from the Seattle City Park, from Dr. Jose Rizal Park. Uh, his encampment got cleared out, took away all of the generators, his outhouse, and his mining operation, he had an open pit mining operation. That happened, what, a couple of weeks ago? A couple of weeks ago. And then he's back. He's out of jail. He's back. He's back with a generator living in the park. So Seattle, or, uh, Andrea was going to text, uh, or I think she called Seattle Parks and Rec and said, hey, guy's back. But this happens so often. It's because you've got a bunch of people on drugs and you got a bunch of people that are wildly mental. They. They need to be in an institution somewhere getting some help. I'm not saying that Steve Irwin, our excavator man, our mining man, renaissance man, I'm not saying he's mental, but he needs to get off the drugs, right? I mean, let's be honest. Because that whole thing, that's why he's returning. That's why he's logging in a city park. Because he gets, he gets whacked out on meth and he just, uh, this is the greatest thing ever. I'm just going to keep doing this got 14 different projects all going at the same time, right? As you do on meth, and everybody recognizes that. But in big cities where you don't incarcerate people and you don't have enough cops, this is what you get. It's like, ah, right, here's your sign. What'd you think was going to happen? Diaz said, um, police chief Diaz said in April of 2021, that more than 200 officers left their jobs in the year after Floyd's murder, citing an anti-police climate in Seattle. Absolutely. We've got probably one of the worst, right? We're standing tall in that department right next to uh, Portland, Portland, horrible down there. I mean, cause you, you've also got this kind of Pacific Northwest, this whole thing where people are woke and you know, they're all about the Northwest and we don't like police. And it just, it, it's infuriating for me to live here, but I live in a community Bellevue, and so it only takes me a you know a few minute drive, and I'm into Seattle. And you, the 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 difference is so noticeable. The first thing you notice is massive amounts of graffiti when you get to the Seattle side. It's just boom, all of a sudden starts because you're basically going to get from where I am to Seattle. You have to go across a bridge. You know, go across 520, which is just to the north of me, or Interstate 90, just to the south of me by a handful of miles. 
And the minute you get over Lake Washington, big, huge body of water, the minute you get over Lake Washington, the graffiti starts. Because you're in Seattle. Because it's free Seattle. Because you've just got, you know, rocket scientists everywhere with their spray cans, you know, beautifying the city. It's just, it's terrible. Seattle police chief said that at the time that with a deployable force of over 1,075 officers, the department was in a staffing crisis. And now we're 200 cops less. I mean, we keep talking about there being a catastrophe waiting to happen. At some point in time, that'll probably happen. And I'll be podcasting on it, you know, probably for days because it'll be something horrific, some kind of natural disaster, some kind of, you know, somebody takes out 100 uh somebody shoots 100 people, something like that. And all the Seattle uh, police resources will have to go to that. And the rest of the city will just be, hey, fend for your own, guys. Yeah, call into the answering, the voice service. Let them know you got a problem. Diaz also said the department is looking into providing help with housing and child care to retain hundreds more patrol and civilian staff. All of these things are good, and that's great because it's super expensive to live in Seattle and you know afford housing and childcare and all that stuff. It's expensive. It's ex- it's really expensive in Seattle for what you get, right? You're like, I get a bunch of graffiti for that? Swell, where do I sign up? Let me buy a house there. It's because of the employment. We've got so many big companies that are in Seattle that you know, people want to live close to where they got to be at work. And that whole work from home forever thing, yeah, that went bye-bye. That went bye-bye just like the defund the police did, right? Now we're back to um, four days a week, three days a week, four days a week. But that remote work forever, ah, that went that went sayonara. So those struggles of day childcare, those struggles of trying to maintain certain things at home are all something that we have to pay attention to. And what I was going to say was that's great. But if you've still got a climate where people do not like the police, it's not going to work out well, right? It's not going to work out well. And the citizenry of Seattle, there are some that do, but vast majority. I mean, the ones that still have up, Black Lives Matter, the ones that still have up, defund the police. It's like, okay, did you not learn anything from that? They don't care. That's where they sit politically. Don't like the police, horrible, they're murdering people left and right. And you're like, okay, did you really look at the stats? Have you really looked into a lot of these cases? Did you take a real hard look? at the fentanyl Floyd story. I mean, just really look at it, just objectively look at it. And you're like, what? This doesn't add up. This doesn't make any sense at all. Diaz said that he was told to speed up officer hires. (laughs) Make them come in, make people be cops, arrest them if they don't. However, he said recruiters are trying to stay nimble and that the city may need to provide more than good pay to rebuild its force. You need top dollar pay, you need all these bennies, and then you also need to have a city that wants to actually employ cops. Right now, you don't. So you can try and go after these people all day long, but ultimately, people know if cops are in demand. People know, all right, is that a profession I really want to get into? Uh, yeah, not so much. Because only about 3% of the cops that actually apply make it through the whole system. 3%. It's a, um, you know, it's a gauntlet. Diaz said the department is also considering housing subsidies as it works to hire 375 more officers. Um, Need to analyze what's going on. A lot of this other stuff is, we're just not going to market our way out of this, but let's continue that at work and build upon it. You know, I did look at the, I did look at, let's take a look, take, take a peek at this. Now, there is... They, they have gone through all kinds of stuff. They're running a business. Here's the Seattle Police Department media plan. I'm not sure if you can read that, but um, yeah, because I kind of shrunk this. We need to go a little bit bigger. How about that? There we go. You've got media results. You've got all kinds. You've got impressions here. They are working on strategies of getting more people in. You've got clicks. You see, you're talking click-through rate right there. You're talking applications. You're talking about videos. You got videos here that you're putting out, trying to get people in recruitment because, you know, not everybody wants to be a cop and sometimes people need to be proud of, what about being a police officer? Oh yeah. Get that kind of started, right? Get that started. 
But even with that, Seattle is 15th on the list. So you've got kind of the perfect storm here for just not enough cops to run the city. And that's what I've, I've been hammering on that forever. And you are seeing some of the end results of that in the inability for a lot of businesses to basically stay, stay open. And then you've got, you know, Highway 99, you've got these areas of the city that are just, it's kind of a free for all. You've got Pike and Pine that's been that way for a long time, the Blade. You've got the International District where you just don't have, you don't have the, the raw bodies like you do in New York City of cops to just put them on whatever. And even then, Governor Hochul in New York City bringing in the National Guard because <laughs> with 36,000 cops or whatever it was in New York City, they're still not able to basically provide a safe environment in their subway system for all the people riding back and forth. Thank heaven Seattle does not have a subway system, right? I mean, that bad boy. You imagine that? Hey, which, which one you want to ride? You want to ride Portland's? Or you want to ride Seattle's subway system? Walk down those stairs. I'm sure it'll be fine. It'll work out just fine. Now, you've got, uh, you've got this sentiment that has created a situation where nobody wants to be a cop. And if you're not paying top dollar, you're not going to get enough cops in there. I don't know what Seattle's going to do. I, I honestly don't. I don't know how you're going to turn the sentiment around. And maybe you don't. I think, I think you just, you're like, all right, this is what Seattle's working with. That's why I don't want to live there. And it'll create a further divide. But as long as big businesses are operating in downtown Seattle, you know, this is what you're working with. So even in the communities in Seattle that have been considered safe, I'm hearing from more and more people saying, yeah, I mean, the criminals know there's not enough cops in Seattle. So, and, and that's not just a Seattle problem. We just read about, you know, Pittsburgh. And, um, you know, it's happening there. It's happening in a lot of these big towns that all went down. Greatest concept ever. Shenanigans for days. Let's defund our police. This will be epic. We're going to be such a safe community after this. We're going to get to the root causes. We're going we're gonna to just make this happen. Yeah, and then it didn't. And then we're still talking about it in 2024. After the vast majority of us said, that's a terrible idea. What are you thinking there? It's what we're working with. It's where we sit. And I don't know, moving forward, I don't know how this is going to get, you know, how is, how is this, how is this going to get much better? You've been working for years and trying to get more cops. I don't know. You're going to have to pay them 120 grand. Even then, all right, 95, 120, is that going to move the needle? Get a 30 K bonus to die on the job every day. Unless you're in love with law enforcement, it's not going to happen. All right. That's it for me on this one. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks so much for supporting. Love to have you subscribe. If you haven't, that's it for me. I'm going to check out. I'll catch you on the next one. Bye for now. Get this squared away. Check this one out. This is why New York migrants aren't accepting free plane or bus tickets. You should go there. I'm a migrant. I need a plane ticket away to Maui. Could you send me to Maui? I need to go to Maui. See how that goes. But they're not taking them. That's the kicker, right? That's the kicker. I'm going to see what you guys are up to on the, uh, oh, I see a re there. Re! Um, see what you guys are talking about. I like to scroll through this and just kind of catch up. You guys have got a lot of comments in through here. The big one. Steve Irwin is awesome. <laughs> I don't know if I'd go... Awesome, but um, Steve Irwin is entertaining. Let's just say that. I need to go over and see him. I need to see, uh, I've got a video from, um, from Andres Suarez. He's, he's got another tent down there. He's got another lean too. He's just camping out in Dr. Jose Rizal Park. All right, let's do, sure we got all this going, right direction. Kill the audio there.
<laughs> hey, cab. <laughs> all cops are bastards. It's just such a ridiculous statement, isn't it? I mean, all cops. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. We're seeing that all over Seattle. It, it, it's horrible. It's just terrible. It's like, I want to see how this, how this works out. All right, Tristan, here we go. Let's do segment number three today. There's no more room at the inn in New York City. The mayor says, yeah, you got to get out. You got to get out. If you've been here 30 days, 60 days, whatever it is, you got to get out. So now they're offering them free plane tickets and also bus tickets out of town. But here's the kicker. The illegal immigrants, they are not accepting them. Nope, we're going to stay here. Let's get into why they're not accepting free plane tickets. Tristan Cut, let's do that one again. There's no more room at the inn in New York City. The mayor says, hey, you only get so many days in our migrant shelters, then you got to go. And to speed up getting people in, getting people out through the process, New York City is handing out free plane tickets to a sanctuary city of your choice, handing out free bus tickets to same said cities as well. The kicker is, the illegals, the migrants, the newcomers, they're not accepting them. Let's get into why. Here we go. Watch a little video. This video here, Tristan will cut this from the end result or not, whatever you want to do. You're the editor. This video here is kind of an overview of kind of where we sit with all the individual migrant crises. And you got, you got a bunch of criminal activity going on there, right? You got snow in Denver, criminal activity. People are pouring out of Haiti. Oof, a lot going on, a lot of shenanigans. Let's watch this video and let me go here. And I'm gonna full screen this bad boy. Audio and play. Mm. Yes. <laughs> then you go to this. <laughs> Remember this? <laughs> if I'm handed a plane ticket to somewhere else and I've just gone through this, probably be like, yeah, that's not a terrible idea, right? Or a bus ticket. Where am I going? All right, let's go there. Because otherwise, I mean, this, this, I mean, this is, this is out of control, right? Randall's Island. Mm. <laughs> Doesn't mean it's right.
Hey, well. Thirteen bucks a month. Yeah, that's tricky. That is problematic. But you know what? You got all kinds of food shelters. You got all kinds of. So on top of, you know, all these issues, these are all, these are all issues because they self-proclaimed being a sanctuary city. Somebody hit me up the other day to say, Hey, what kind of, if you, if you describe yourself as not a sanctuary city, what kind of funding will you lose? You won't, you won't because it's, it's just, you you've does it. You might lose some favor with all these Democrat run, you know, politicians, but it's it's this self-proclaimed thing. There isn't a box. Are you sanctuary or not? It's more. Hey, we'll take your illegals. We'll take them. You've self-proclaimed you know proclaimed that. And and so from a standpoint of federal funding, there's no funds going to sanctuary cities versus non-sanctuary cities. I just kind of want to make that clear. But what's interesting is that, is that New York has a specific poll, right? It's got a specific poll. And let's get into that. Why would people want to stay in these environments because there, there's a lot more kind of, I think, underneath the layers that people don't recognize. Migrants booted from the Big Apple's overflowing shelter system on Tuesday said that they're turning down the city's offer for free plane or bus tickets out of town because it's too hard to start over elsewhere. All right, okay. Of the more than two dozen asylum seekers the Post spoke to outside an intake center in the East Village, most said that they preferred to stay put and try their luck in New York City, even if it meant going more weeks without a shelter bed. I watched a video last night. They're crashed out outside of the Roosevelt. They're, they're literally lying on the sidewalk with a piece of cardboard down or maybe a blanket. I mean, talk about that. I mean, that just sounds terrible. But it's better to do that and maybe get in line the next day to get reinstated into the housing system than it is to try go somewhere else. And so they're turning down, you know, plane tickets and bus tickets. Now nah, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep running my luck here and see if I can get into the system here in New York City, because New York City is handing out so many freebies. Freebies, just all day long. Why leave here and start all over? said Jesus Hernandez, 40 of Venezuela adding he expects to wait four days to a week to find out about where he'll be living next. Some joke the dating scene is what's keeping them here. That, okay, all right. So you escape from your home country, call it Venezuela. You're going to go to New York City, you meet a cute Venezuelan girl there, right? I mean, that's your option. You go to somewhere else, you may not have much of a community of the folks that you're used to from back home. And you don't have the resources being handed out the New York City is. So you've got a real pull there because these people are young. A lot of them are young males and they are literally looking to make a new life for themselves. And the freebies that New York City has handed out are not enough to offset. Hey, you can go over here. We'll get you there for free. I think it's like uh, less than uh, 3% are taking up the offer of free free transportation so why leave here and start all over some joke the dating scene i want job i want to stay i want wife too said one senegalese migrant i mean i get it i get it this is what you want but taxpayers are paying for all this nonsense right taxpayers are paying for all of this nonsense and so you wanting a wife? Well, a lot of people, yeah, want, I want, um, I want stuff in my life as well, right? Uh, I want the real estate market to pick up right now. We're on year two of, of almost end of two, year two 
in real estate of things just being slow, especially on the appraisal side, because when interest rates bump up like they did and they haven't come down at all, and I'm not sure that they're going to come down much, although it is an election year, there's not enough people out there willing to refinance. There's no incentive for them, for anybody to refinance if you have a mortgage rate, you know, two and three quarters, 3%, 4%, 5%, 6%, and mortgage rates are at six and three quarter. Nobody's going to refine. That's always a large portion of our business. So I would like in a perfect world, I don't want to, I don't want a wife. Good Lord, that set me back lots of money. I don't want that, but I want stuff in my life. I get it. You want stuff. I want a job. I want to stay. I want a wife who didn't want to be named. I want to be anonymous. I want to be anonymous. The Post spoke to asylum seekers and staff at the former St. Bridget School on East 7th Street after it was revealed fewer than 2%, 2% is the magic number of migrants there willing to relocate to another city or state after make, maxing out their 30-day shelter stay. Now, it's 30-day shelter stay for, is that for a family in New York City? And is it 14 days for an individual? Something like that. It's pretty short because they're trying to, trying to get people through that system, right? They come here and all want to stay. Less than 2% take up the, the offer to move because they know they're going to get all the bennies. They know they're going to get all of the free stuff. So I don't really blame them. I mean, I'd go where the free stuff is too. That's just called being smart. These guys aren't dumb. And, and New York City wonders, <laughs> how come there's so many here? 170,000 in New York City. How are, how are all of the illegals that have been kicked out of Denver's shelter system, how are they doing in the snowstorm? I mean, that's... That's got to be mind blowing for a lot of them because they have not experienced snow like that. I mean, until you experience one of those big snowstorms, you know, piles up like feet in a day, you you're just like, what is going on here? Oh, isn't this great? We're gonna make snowballs. We're gonna throw snowballs at each other. We're gonna make Frosty the Snowman, and then you realize you can't leave. Your car doesn't go anywhere. Garbage cans get covered. You can't see the street lights. Traffic lights stop working. Just basically everything comes to a grinding halt. And you're living in a tent on the sidewalk. Good luck with that. Those tents are not designed. Even the hardcore four season tents are not designed for massive amounts of snowfall. It just, you know, crater in. The newly released data from the city's emergency management agency showed an average of just 30 migrants per day out of the 1,600 who head to the intake center were taking up the city's offer to relocate elsewhere. They, they just want to be in New York City. New York City has always welcomed the migrant population. But the big, huge difference there, and that's something that, you know, I think a lot of people don't really dig that deep. Vast majority of those people came in legally, right? They came in legally. They started their paperwork ahead of time. Whatever the migration system was, they did it legally. These people, every single one of them are coming in illegally. That's the big difference. And that's why it's taxing these systems so hard because all of a sudden, you know, you got 170,000 of them because New York City self-proclaimed, we want you, we want them. We want the illegals. We want the newcomers. This is what we're doing. This is our virtue signaling to the point where they don't have enough resources. Now nah, we need some federal dollars up in here. And, and then we're, we're trying to get these people out. We're trying to give them bus tickets, plane tickets anywhere. But there's so much of a pull in New York City that why would they leave? They want a wife. They want the free gift card. They, they want shelter. They want how they want health care. Yeah. Maybe it is worth it to take that bus ride out to LA. Take that plane ride out to LA. See what's going on. Get a little sunshine. Nah, it's because you've got a community. You've got a massive community there. And so you're you're literally just, you know, you're 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 bringing that in. Hundreds of single adult asylum seekers have been heading to the center each day in a bid to re-enter the city's shelter system after Eric Adams moved their limit stays to 30 days to free up space. Okay, so it's 30 days for individuals, probably 60 days for families. And in those areas, that's where you've got all the criminal activity going on, outside of the Roosevelt, outside of these areas, because they're, they're just, they're congregating and you've just got shenanigans going on. You've just got 
craziness. Some migrants, remember the uh, scooter, all the scooter incidents? Well, they're borrowing a scooter and they're borrowing somebody else's ID and they're, they're doing Uber Eats. They're, they're doing, you know, whatever it is illegally because they're trying to make some money. But New York City is going to be the big draw no matter what, just because of the population. So some migrants said that they've waited 20 days to reenter the system. All right, three weeks on the sidewalk. That's a tough go. And they would rather scramble for a place to sleep than accept the free ticket out of the Big Apple. That's the bottom line. Big Apple has more to offer, more freebies, more stuff. And that's why you're seeing, continually seeing right now, you're seeing cities adjacent to, you know, Aurora, adjacent to Colorado, Denver, Colorado is an example. Yeah, we're not doing the sanctuary city thing. We're, we're ixnay on that. We're not doing it. We don't have the resources, takes away from taxpayers' money funding other things. And that's happening in, in Seattle, it's happening. We just had a, one of my big uh, videos of um, last couple of days is a bunch of protesters rushed the Seattle City Council meeting and they did a bunch of protests, basically shut down the meeting multiple times in Seattle City Council. We've got a new um, president, Sarah Nelson. She owns Fremont Brewing, of which I'm a big fan. And she's basically saying, yeah, we're not having any of these shenanigans. Arrest them. Arrest those bastard protesters. She didn't say bastard, but I would have said that if I was uh, president. Arrest those bastards right there. And I don't want to see them leave until the year 2030 from jail. Just hold them involuntarily forever. Just hold them. Just, I, I don't like them. Just, yeah, incarcerate. Now, you can't do that. But, um, <laughs> you know, with the ridiculousness that we saw in the summer of love here in Seattle, sure would be fun. Oh, you're a protester. Jail. One-way ticket to jail. Never mind flying to Maui. Jail. Put that person in jail. Protester. Don't care about your Second Amendment rights. Whatever it is. First Amendment right. First Amendment. Second Amendment is the gun. Don't care about your First Amendment rights. Jail, you're ridiculous. You don't know what you're talking about. But in Seattle, they, they, they rushed the Seattle City Council because the immigrants didn't have enough housing. And somebody told the protesters, well, if you go to Seattle, they'll listen to you. And you just got the blind leading the blind in these big cities. But Sarah Nelson, she shut it down. She had them arrested and they continued the meeting and all is well in paradise, right? So check out that video. It's kind of an entertaining one. The migrants or the, the protesters, are, they're, they're just, they're jumping on the bandwagon and that's what they do. I'm grateful for the help. Of course, I'd love to see some other part of the country. This is somebody who didn't take the offer of acceptance, but I can't complain about my time here, said Alex Puerta, 49. Once I start working full time, I definitely won't leave, but permission to work is taking a long time. These people don't want to go anywhere. They're happy with what they're getting from New York because they're handing them the partridge in a pear tree, right? They're handing them everything on their Christmas list. Puerta's friend Hernandez, a former travel agent, also said he's still waiting on permission to work after being in the city for six months. Puerta said that he hauls an air mattress around for them to sleep on. Okay, that is not light. Ever hauled an air mattress around? I have a queen size air mattress and one of my big duffel bags to take camping, car camping. And it's heavy. It's heavy. Haul that around. All right. Set up here. How are they uh, filling it with air? Do they have a little compressor? Probably not, right? I haven't had to sleep on the street, thank God. I sleep in churches in Harlem or the Bronx where they kick us out, he said. All right. Here's an individual. Heidi Gomez. That's who we've got going on here. This is Heidi. She's a 28-year-old trans woman from Venezuela. How's that working in Venezuela? Hmm. Said that she was grateful for the city's free health care. Uh, who isn't? Who doesn't want free health care? And was unwilling to accept the free ticket offer because her documents are more complicated than others. She's got that whole dead name thing, right? Ah, guy that I used to be, I'm this girl now. Literally, she's got that. Now, it says here that you were, that you're Heidi now, but you were Bob before. Tell me a little bit about that. It's your immigration hearing. A little tricky. Meanwhile, Heidi Gomez, a 28-year-old trans woman from Venezuela, said she's grateful. I need to file my documents under my old name, too. Okay. All right. Okay. I'm willing to change my name, and, and uh, I'm waiting to change my name and complete my transition. 
Yeah, oh, by all means, we should fund that. Yeah, let's give, give those people some money too as well. Gomez adds, adding that the extra slap, uh, extra step was a burden she doesn't want to have to repeat. So these people, have, they've, they've, they've wormed their way into New York City. Why would they leave? They won't. They, they don't need to. People here in Seattle, same thing. They're already working the system. They've got protesters willing to take them to City Hall. Let's protest there. They'll listen. Oh, they're not going to listen? My love, I don't care how exotic a place they want to send. They can include hotel too. But I'm staying in New York, honey. Ugh. Okay. All right. You know, diversity, right? Diversity, inclusion, equity. Got to work on all that. Right? Well, New York City's working on it, and that's what it looks like. It looks like um, her uh, sleeping out on the sidewalk waiting for housing. The city has so far coughed up $7.6 million to reticket migrants out of the Big Apple since the start of this crisis in the spring of 22. All right, $7.6 million out. Think about what Greg Abbott has spent. He has spent $140 million. $140 million. And look at how much bang for his buck he's got. And all New York City is doing for close to, to $8 million is just sending them away. Greg Abbott has just been sending them willy-nilly. Denver, here you come. Philadelphia, D.C., New York, Chicago. He's really been effective in this whole thing. And um, so now what you're seeing is you're seeing the impact on New York City offering all those freebies. Nobody wants to leave. Why would you possibly leave if you're already getting everything, with the exception of that, you know, that pesky housing thing? But hey, it's springtime. It's a beautiful time of the year to be out on the sidewalk, maybe sleep in the park. No, I don't want to see anybody do that because it's annoying to the rest of us. Yeah, let's go play at the park. Ah, I got 14, well, you know, homeless people. We're not sure. Drug addicts, we're not sure. Migrants, we don't really know. You know what? Let's just go home. Forget the park. That's probably not the safest concept ever. Yeah, you want to see people be able to enjoy public spaces. You want to see people not lined up around the sidewalk of the migrant center. But that's not what we're doing. And these people aren't leaving because they've got such a great ride, with the exception of the housing deal, for everything else. Healthcare, you name it. And this is this is not going to go anywhere anytime soon. Because these folks are coming in. They are they're coming in. Some of what I've been researching lately is that Mexico right now is their president is good buddies with Biden. Yeah. Right? Like uh, anybody friends with Biden, you, you, you're just like, what? Ugh. Ugh. Yeah. No. I was in the gym uh, a couple of days ago. Today is Thursday. It was Tuesday. There was a, a girl there. She had a hat that said, Biden sucks. At my gym, there's not a lot of politics. Everybody's, for the most part, there's a lot of conservative people because there's a lot of money. But this chick, uh, number one, she was a woman and um, she was some kind of, she wasn't white, let's just put it that way. And she wearing a hat that says, Biden sucks. I just thought that was great. I was dying to go up to her and say, hey, like your hat. You know, old guy working out at the gym, talking to some somebody else. It just don't do that. So I gave her the two thumbs up in my head and said, I'll, I'll have to remember that for the podcast. Biden sucks. <laughs> How do you really feel about that? But what's happening down in Mexico, and part of the reason the migrant numbers are so far down off of their record numbers in December, is that the Mexican government, if you're in Mexico City, you, if you get busted, if you're one of these migrants and you're in Mexico City and you are looking to get across the southern border, Mexico federales are moving you back. Think of it moving you back one stop, and that's about a six and a half hour drive away. I don't remember the name of the city. And if you're getting busted in that area, that area that you're moving, getting moved back from, if, if customs and uh, federales, you know, catch a group of people or whatever, they're moving them one stop back from that. And so what's happening right now is these groups of people are literally being moved back between six and a half hour drive or three and a half, two and a half, three hours. They're, they're being sent all the way back to darn near the Mexico-Guatemala border, is it? I mean, they're basically being sent back to step one. They're not being deported into other countries beyond the southern border of Mexico. 
but they are being moved back. And so what that's doing is that's rotating a lot of these folks through multiple times because as they get up, you know, they've migrated, they've gotten buses, they've gotten walked, they've done whatever. As they've gotten further up, ah, they got set back. So you don't have the huge numbers coming through right now because those people are kind of on a treadmill. There's a fair amount of that going on. And that's why you're seeing the really low numbers at the southern border. That's one of the explanations. You've also got seasonal. You've got you know, January, February are typically lower numbers, but we're coming into the good weather. So it'll be really interesting to see moving forward if the Mexico government keeps up, you know, if they're keeping up their buddy buddy status with the United States. But the issue with that treadmill deportation, you're not really deportating, you're, you're setting them back. Let's, let's move you one step back because we don't want you to get into the U.S. That's the big issue. We need to give Biden some breathing room here. I think that's what's going on. Biden is getting breathing room, but it's an artificial breathing room because eventually that treadmill is going to break and all those people are just going to boop and start coming in. That's, that's my opinion because those people, the same people that are requiring resources in New York City, they're human beings. They have babies, they have medical needs, they need food, they got to go to the bathroom somewhere. All of those human, you know, needs, the people in Mexico have too. People that are trying to get through Mexico into the United States, they have all of those same things too, right? So the resources are only going to go so far in Mexico before Mexico says, all right, you got your two-month reprieve, you got your whatever reprieve. Good luck on the elections there, Joe. But man, we've run out of money again. We don't have the resources for this. Uh, good luck with, uh, with, with taking on uh, you know, the southern border. I think that will happen here at some point uh, rather soon. But um, what's been interesting is then the, the push of the people that are getting through that southern border, they're going into California. They're going into Arizona. You're seeing those numbers escalate heavily, whereas the southern border in Texas, Governor Abbott has done his thing. Not so much. Those numbers are way, way down. And a lot of it has to do with they've just been repelled from that area. Texas National Guard, razor wire. There's a big story recently on the airboats. That's been, that's been down there since the beginning. But their National Guard is getting training on the airboats, you know, the ones with the big, huge prop, and they can go on top of sloughs, and they can go on top of, you know, super shallow areas of the river. It's stuff like that where they're just running through the river and they're catching people and repelling them, sending them to the other side. If you want, don't want to deal with that, if you're the cartel, you're going to take your clients further up the river into a different part and you're going to make your, you're going to make your transition and get them over the border there onto their next segment, whatever that is. And um, so the whole thing is just this wild cluster of things depending on each other. And I think you will see some of the numbers start to escalate as far as crossings back into the U.S. Because what you've got going on right now is a temporary scenario for sure. Because these countries that all these people are running from, Venezuela, Haiti, those are not getting better politically. They're not stabilizing, right? Yeah, you got a bunch of criminal activity. You got shenanigans. People are running from shenanigans. So that's, that's kind of what I'm going to leave you with on this one. All right. That's it for me on this segment. Would love to have you subscribe if you haven't already. Hit that like button. Hit that notification bell. The best thing you can do is share this content with others because that tells the algorithm, hey, this is worth tuning into. If you've tuned in so far to this point in the podcast, thanks so much for being here and I'll catch up with you in the next one. Bye for now. All right. Let's see what you guys are talking about on the... Uh, live stream here. Got to get up to current. You guys are, you guys are going through a lot of stuff. Genetics count eight. They ain't human. No snow in New York. No snow in New York. Is that? Yeah. Guess we'd see that, wouldn't we? Somebody is sewing. All right. Yeah. You guys got stuff going on. <laughs> Transient musical chairs. Topeka is begging for migrants. <laughs> it is. It's musical chairs, isn't it? Yeah. 
Airbnb means you sleep on an air mattress. Well, uh, got to do what you got to do, right? Interesting. The air and Airbnb was on an air mattress on a college kid's floor. That's how they got started. Is that true? Is that true? That makes sense. I'm seeing more and more people go away from Airbnb because it got so saturated and the fees have gotten really expensive. I know my son does it with his house over in uh, Seattle. And he gets, uh, during the summer, um, Sean, if the migrants have air mattress, they can start a sidewalk Airbnb. <laughs> they can. Hey, here's your four foot by six foot section. You can get one mattress in, not two, you get one mattress in there. That'll be $23. Take it or leave it. Take it or leave it. Yeah, I could see that happening. Now, my, my son gets big money uh, per night during the, the summer season here in Seattle because there's, I guess, nobody in his neighborhood renting out Airbnbs. He seems to do really well. He ends up staying at my house, which I don't mind because my house is big house for one dude. And um, yeah, it's, it's kind of what I'm doing. I walk around this really big house. And it's not a big house, but for one guy, any house is big, right? All right. Thanks so much for being here, guys. I'm going to go. I got to go do some eating and do some business stuff. So you guys take care. I will see you um, next Tuesday. Next Tuesday. It's Thursday. Tuesday. I hope you have a great weekend. Do something cool. It's almost gardening season. Although if you're in Denver, not so, I hope you're a uh, snow shovel. Remember, remember, snow shoveling is the greatest um, precursor to heart attacks for people in the older generation older demographic that's me included so i can openly say that um yeah don't don't go ham on the shoveling of the snow if you're really snowed in i hope you stay safe and um i'll see you on tuesday thanks for being here bye for now